Welcome to Lecturio Podcast. Here we break down complex medical concepts into clear and concise discussions that reinforce your understanding. And today, we are tackling a topic literally everyone has experienced, fever. It seems so simple, but the physiology behind it is incredibly fascinating. It really is. So let's start with the basics. What exactly is a fever? Is there a specific number we're looking for? There is. Generally, we define fever as a body temperature of at least 38 degrees Celsius, which is about 100.4 Fahrenheit. Got it. 38 degrees Celsius. But normal temperature isn't just one number, right? I feel like mine is always a little different. Exactly. Normal body temperature can range from about 35.3 to 37.7 Celsius. Plus, it fluctuates. It's usually lowest in the early morning and highest in the late afternoon. And it also depends on factors like age, BMI, and even sex. The text points out that women tend to have slightly higher basal body temperatures. Right! And this brings us to a super important point of confusion. Is every single elevated temperature a fever? That's the key distinction, isn't it? The difference between fever and, say, hyperthermia. Yes! Think of the hypothalamus in your brain as a thermostat. In a true fever, something has told that thermostat to turn the temperature UP. The body's set point is intentionally raised. Okay, so the body is actively trying to be hotter. But with hyperthermia, like in heat stroke, the thermostat is normal. The body is just overwhelmed and can't get rid of heat fast enough. Precisely. And then there's hyperpyrexia, which is just a term for an extraordinarily high fever, over 41.5 degrees Celsius. But it's still a fever with a raised set point. That thermostat analogy is perfect. So what's turning the thermostat up? What causes that set point to change? The culprits are called pyrogens. They can be exogenous, meaning from outside the body, like lipopolysaccharides from bacteria, or endogenous, which our own immune cells produce. Ah, the pyrogenic cytokines. I see things like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and TNF listed here. Yep. And whether they're from outside or inside, they all trigger the same final pathway. They cause an increase in a molecule called prostaglandin E2, or PGE2, right in the hypothalamus. And PGE2 is the signal that tells the thermostat, hey, time to crank up the heat. You got it. And once that set point is raised, your body suddenly thinks it's cold. What does it do when it's cold? It tries to warm up. You get vasoconstriction shunting blood away from the skin, which is why your hands and feet feel cold. And then the shivering starts. The shivering, the rigors. That's your muscles contracting like crazy to generate heat, all to meet this new higher temperature target. It's an active regulated process. It's incredible. So the most common trigger for this whole cascade is infection, obviously. By far, the common cold, the flu, pneumonia, you name it. But it's not the only cause. Right. The text points out some other important ones. There's neurogenic fever. From direct damage to the hypothalamus itself, it's resistant to antipyretics and isn't associated with sweating. And a big one, drug-induced fever. So many medications can cause it, from antimicrobials and anticonvulsants to even illegal drugs like cocaine and amphetamines. That's such a critical differential to keep in mind. So, we get a fever, we feel miserable, but is it all bad? The body must be doing this for a reason. It absolutely is. Fever can be beneficial. Those endogenous pyrogens actually enhance the function of our immune cells, like neutrophils and macrophages. They get better at phagocytosis. And the higher temperature itself can inhibit the growth of some bacteria and viruses. It basically creates a less hospitable environment for them. But, of course, there's a downside. Extremely high fevers put a huge metabolic demand on the body, which can be dangerous for people with heart or lung disease. It can lead to direct cellular damage and, in severe cases, even sepsis syndrome. Which leads us to the big question, to treat or not to treat? Well, the common reflex is to immediately reach for acetaminophen or ibuprofen. But the guidance here suggests treatment is mainly for comfort, to reduce the headache, the muscle aches, or for patients with those underlying conditions. I see that, but I'd argue that in a hospital setting, especially with critically ill patients, being more proactive with antipyretics can be justified to reduce that metabolic stress. Sometimes observing the fever pattern is less important than protecting the patient. That's a very fair point. 
It's definitely a clinical judgment call, not a black and white rule. And if you do treat, acetaminophen is generally preferred, but NSAIDs like ibuprofen are also effective. And remember our thermostat analogy. For a true fever, you use antipyretics to lower the set point, but for hyperthermia, they don't work. The set point is already normal. For that, you need rapid physical cooling. Such a crucial point. Don't give Tylenol for a heat stroke. Okay, before we wrap up, let's quickly mention some of those serious clinical syndromes where fever is a hallmark sign. Absolutely. Things like dress syndrome, a severe drug hypersensitivity reaction, and malignant hyperthermia, a genetic reaction to certain anesthetics. Don't forget neuroleptic malignant syndrome from antipsychotics and serotonin syndrome from antidepressants. In these cases, fever is a major red flag for a life-threatening condition. Wow, we've covered a lot. So let's quickly summarize. Great idea. So key point one, fever is a regulated rise in the hypothalamic set point driven by PGE2. It's different from hyperthermia. Two, while infection is the most common cause, always consider drugs, CNS issues, and other non-infectious etiologies. Three, fever is a double-edged sword. It has immune boosting benefits, but can be harmful at extreme temperatures. And four, Treatment is for comfort or to protect vulnerable patients, and you must know if you're treating a true fever or hyperthermia because the management is completely different. That was a fantastic breakdown of a fundamental concept. Thanks for joining us on the Lecturio podcast, and we'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in. Keep exploring Lecturio's features to strengthen your knowledge and master key medical concepts. See you in the next episode.